Good morning. Um, as he was talking about those anonymous letters, I've only received one anonymous letter since I've been here, and it was pretty interesting. <clears throat> but Frank Harrington, I may have told you, um, was the pastor of Peachtree Pres. Some of y'all are former Peachtree Pres members. I've met a number of you who've been to Peachtree Pres before you moved to St. Luke's and then moved here somehow. And <clears throat> he said he once got came back after preaching a sermon, he came back to his inbox <clears throat> and he reached in and there was a slip of paper and it just had the word idiot on it. He said, it's the first time somebody had signed their letter and not written a letter. <laughs> and uh, Brian, because you didn't have a, a joke today, uh, I, I heard this one the other day and I'll just see what you think. There was an older guy who went out fishing and uh, as he was pulling in, thought he had a great fish and it turned out to be a frog. And as he was unhooking the frog, the frog started talking. And the frog said, if you'll just kiss me, I'll become a beautiful princess. You've heard this one, right? And uh, <clears throat> he, he, he didn't. He just took the frog and stuck it in his pocket. And the frog just kept protesting, kiss me, and I'll become a beautiful princess. He says, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> so today, we're back to talk about Jonah. I hope you've enjoyed Jonah a little bit, getting to know this, this, this book, this uh, <clears throat> very short that uh, <clears throat> may not fit with some of your ideas of who God is in the Old Testament, but uh, we gather with Jonah today, and just to remind you of the trip that Jonah took, if you'll show that first slide there, Mark, I can't tell, I can only see people, so I don't know what slides up, there we go, um, Jonah, and this, this sermon on Sunday is about breaking free from anger, the word anger appears six times in this passage, and it's about uh, Jonah's anger at what God is doing. And it's kind of a playful time. God is sort of playing with him a little bit here at the end. Just sort of, you ever push somebody's buttons on purpose? Or anybody push your buttons? It seems like on purpose. Well, uh, that's kind of what God seems to be doing with Jonah here in the fourth chapter. So I'll show you a map again, just to remind you that he, he starts out just where kind of where the word I is and it, the letter I is in Israel, he heads down to Joppa, uh, gets on a boat there in Joppa, heads out into the Mediterranean, and, and then leaves the Mediterranean, uh, gets spit out on shore and has to make that 14 day hike up to Nineveh. No easy way to get there. Uh, if you look, they probably, you see the island of, it looks like Crete that is pointing to, to that area. Uh, that area is probably, uh, you know, point right there, you would go up along that area and try to come down along the river. You wouldn't walk straight across the desert. Uh, that might be a little bit more difficult. And we remind me, I remind you that at that time they called Nineveh that great city. And once again, it's just a little dig to say, uh, Jonah, I'm sending you to a great city. I'm sending you to that wonderful city of Tuscaloosa or whatever that great city is for you or not great city is for you. Whatever city you would least like to go to and least be called great, that's the next slide, which is uh, Nineveh, that great city. And they have sort of a depiction of what they think it looked like back in Jonah's day that Jonah went to preach. But today, it looks a little bit more like this. Old Nineveh, it's still in ruins. And as I said before, it's near Mosul in Iraq. In this book, the word great doesn't just appear to talk about the city. The word big or great appears 14 times in 47 verses. And uh, there, there are a number of things that are called great. Uh, there's a great city. There's a great wind. There's a great storm. There's a great fish. There's a great prayer that Jonah prays. There's a great sermon, the shortest one in history. And there's a great God who shares great love, who gives them 40 days to change. And that's a great second chance over and over again. And so I think the writer of Jonah is trying to show us with extreme language over and over again. I remind you that um, Nineveh was a place where brutality was celebrated. Their graphic reliefs on the wall were just depictions of killings and beheadings and ripping uh, babies from their mother's womb. And uh, the stone masons were wonderful. They did an incredible job. And they even tried to show motion uh, with some of uh, with some of the things that they did, uh, showing a person in several different phases of killing someone, and uh, this was really what was celebrated there. So now we turn to Jonah, the fourth chapter, and 
like to read that to you and uh, we'll take it pretty slow. It's not a very long chapter, but this was dis very displeasing to Jonah and Jonah became angry. What was very displeasing to Jonah? What was very displeasing to Jonah was that the Lord changed his mind. God changed his mind when he was given the chance to rain down fire and brimstone on the people of Nineveh. He had said to Jonah, go and proclaim a word to them. And as you may remember, it was a word that meant several different things. Nineveh could be overturned. Nineveh could be destroyed. Nineveh could be changed. And I think everybody heard it in their own way. But the people of Nineveh surprised everyone and they turned from their evil ways. They turned from the violence that was in their hands. And when they made that turn, God relented and didn't bring any punishment upon them. And in fact, the king of the leader of the whole country decides we're going to write this down and make sure that everyone lives into this. <clears throat> and they put on sackcloth and ashes on everyone. And this is very displeasing to Jonah and Jonah becomes angry. And so Jonah prays again. Do you remember the last time he prayed? Uh, the in the belly of the fish. I mean, at his lowest point, he prays. And here he is again at a low point and he decides to pray. He prays to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? I told you so, God. God, I told you this would happen. This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's the kind of God who loves us. Uh, and some people don't think of the Old Testament God that way. But over and over again in the Old Testament, I'll give you some examples from the Psalms in, in a few minutes. Uh, in Exodus, uh, you hear that refrain that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life for me, for it's better for me to die than to live. You see how it's <clears throat> such a book of extremes. Uh, <clears throat> he's still in conversation with God, but in conversation with God, he says, I just need to die. And then God does not <clears throat> berate him for his anger and this is uh, i think one of the keys for me of this whole passage he doesn't look at jonah and say you have no right to be angry who do you think you are were you there like in job when i made the foundations of the world who do you think you are <clears throat> the the lord just kind of puts up a, a mirror and asks the question is it right for you to be so angry is it right for you to be so angry. Um, any of your wives or people in your family ever said that to you? I've, I've made the mistake of saying things like, uh, you shouldn't be so angry. <clears throat> There's no reason for you to be so upset. But God is way smarter than I am. And God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? And Jonah's response is to go out of the city and sit down east of the city and to make a booth for himself, it reminds us of the, the Hebrew festival, the, the Jewish festival of Sukkoth, where they make booths and uh, live outside under what is kind of a lean-to. And they made a booth for himself, and he sat there in its shade, but it's not a great shade because it's just a lean-to. He makes some, own, some of his own shade, but he sits there and waits to see what becomes of the city. And you see sort of the contrast between Jonah and God at this time. The contrast between Jonah and God is that Jonah is passive, waiting for destruction. And God is active, trying not to let Jonah destroy himself. Because that's what anger does, doesn't it? It can really destroy us from the inside out. And I'm sure you've seen it happen to people. Uh, you've been playing someone in a game. And they get angry and they lose their head and they lose the game. So we turn and just like I'm angry about Nolan Arenado, I just would like to s speak that into. I just I just want to say that to the Cardinal fans in the room. It's just patently unfair. They continue to acquire talent like that. So the next slide there. So you've heard the scripture text from the first part. And <clears throat> what I found interesting in the research that I was doing 
is that in a, in a thing called the Tanakh, which I'll explain in a minute, in the Tanakh, which is sort of the Hebrew version of the, the, the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew version doesn't say that he became angry. The Hebrew version says it deeply grieved Jonah. Does that give you a different picture of Jonah? That, that, he, that he, it grieved him deeply. It didn't make him angry. It deeply grieved him. And I think sometimes as a pastor, it is easier for me to take a step back and say, what's really going on beneath the surface of this person's anger? There's something else going on. And uh, I know it's directed at me or at the church or at someone else in the church right now, uh, but there's something deeper going on in this person's life. And grief comes from loss. Uh, grief comes from loss. I always hear people say, well, people don't like change. I don't think that's true. I think people like change. Paul, if I said you're going to get a $10,000 raise next year. Okay, people don't mind change. If I'm going to say you're going to lose $10,000 next year. People don't like loss and, and they struggle with loss. They don't mind change if it's a positive change. So I've always found that people are willing to go with changes uh, and it's how much loss can they tolerate? How much loss can they tolerate? And for Jonah, this is a, a great deal of loss. And it, it, my heart goes out to a Jonah who is deeply grieved. My heart doesn't go out as much to Jonah who becomes angry with God uh, because God is does what God says God's going to do. But deeply grieved gives me a little bit more understanding and I've always just tried to take a step back and try to understand what's going on. Do you remember the story of the fellow who was on the subway and his kids were just bouncing all around the subway? He had three kids and they were uh, going everywhere on the subway train. And um, the dad just was kind of sitting there and was oblivious to everything the kids were doing. And finally, somebody uh, called out and said to him, you need to control your kids. You need to get your kids under control. And the fellow said, Oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're coming from their mother's funeral and I wasn't thinking about that. It gives you a whole different perspective. And if we can see, help to see what people are going through, I think it helps us to more fully understand. So deeply grieved and it comes from the Tanakh. Uh, how many of y'all know the Tanakh? Anybody know what that word means? Don't Tanakh it till you tried it, Brian. Okay, the Tanakh is the Jewish Bible and as known in Hebrew, and it's an acronym for the three sections of the Bible. If you'll move to that next slide there for me. Did I? Yes. Uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books is the Ta in Tanakh. The Nevi'im, the prophets, is the Na in Tanakh. And then finally, the uh, writings is the Ketuvim. And those are the three sections of the Hebrew Old Testament. And it's uh, abbreviated the Tanakh. And I just said, as I was reading that, I like to read when I'm doing Old Testament passages, I like to read both what the uh, translations are in the, in the larger Bible, and then I like to read what is in the Tanakh, because sometimes there's just a little difference, there's just a little nuance, and deeply grieved was one that jumped out at me this time. Next slide. And so we see Jonah's relationship with God. Jonah's relationship with God <clears throat> is that He's displeased with God. He's angry with God. But I love that he is still in conversation with God. And God can take that. Uh, and, and really good people can take that. You can be displeased with them. You can be angry with them. But if you'll still stay in relationship with them and still in conversation, you can still grow. Even with Jonah's anger at God, God doesn't let him go. God kind of sticks with him and continues to prod and push him. Uh, he's still in conversation, and that's how he understands God. And I love uh, the way that um, <clears throat> Fran reminded me the other night. He said, it's like the older brother in the prodigal son. Jonah is like the older brother in the prodigal son. God does something extravagant. God does something with reckless abandon and loves in a wonderful way through the father with the son who has run away. And the older brother in that story is just like Jonah here, angry about um, 
what what God's love and God's care, just as the older brother. So, Fran, I thank you for that reminder. Turn to your neighbor. Uh, uh, raise your hand if you're more of an older brother. Anybody? More of the younger brother? You know who you are. Okay. I'm the younger brother that happens to be more like the older brother. How about that? I have an older brother, but he's more like the younger brother. And it it's kind of sets up this... Um, this difference between who God is and who Jonah is, Mark, if you'll go to that next slide, of who God is. God is gracious. God is merciful. God is slow to anger. God is abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And this is a creedal statement, a, a statement of belief. You know how we talk about, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Uh, the, the Hebrew people would say this. We believe in a God who is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, who will relent from punishing. And they say that over and over again in, in, in the Psalms and, and in Exodus. And on in contrast, Jonah is ungrateful and ungracious. He's not merciful. He wants vengeance. He wants God to be judge and jury. He's quick to anger, but he's also quick to happiness. Isn't that how we are sometimes? I mean, you're so mad one minute and then some, a little thing happens and you're so happy and then you get so mad the next minute abounding in steadfast hate. I never heard, heard that phrase before. I just made it up, but I liked it. Uh, abounding in steadfast hate. And if you didn't hear the sermon last week, I talked about how Henry Aaron hung on to all the hate mail. He never uh, let go of any of the hate mail and too many people don't let go of the hate. He was able to let go of the hate, but he didn't let go of the hate mail and it motivated him to be the player and the person that he was abounding in steadfast hate and ready to punish at the drop of a hat. So uh, as we look at Jonah 4.2, uh, as I said, it's a creedal statement. <coughs> and if Psalm 86, verse 15, this isn't on your slides, but Psalm 86, verse 15, but you, O Lord, are good, are, are you are, are a, you, O Lord, are God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Jonah himself must be immersed in the Psalms. Those Psalms, the Psalm book, sort of the hymn book of the, the Hebrew people. Jonah must have known the Psalms well because when he is in the belly of the whale, he appeals to the Psalms and there's a piece of a Psalm in almost every line. And the same thing here uh, in Jonah in the last chapter when he says, oh, God, you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He's quoting a psalm. You can find it in Psalm 86. You can find it in Psalm 103. You can find it in Psalm 111. You can find it in Psalm 145. And so he was immersed in the Hebrew scripture and knew those stories about who God was. And so even with who Jonah is, how does God deal with Jonah? How does God deal with who Jonah is? And how does God deal with Jonah's anger? How does God deal with Jonah's anger? Well, as I said earlier, I've made the mistake when telling people, when dealing with anger, of telling people, not be, don't be angry. I've tried that with my wife. Can I get a witness? Don't be angry. Don't be angry with me. You shouldn't be angry. There's no reason for you to be angry. And, and how does that How's that go? Makes them more angry is my experience. It doesn't dissipate the anger. Uh, when I say things, I remember uh, when we were first married, I said something like, when you, when you can be rational, we'll talk about this. And uh, we were in a small apartment and she was so mad that she ran and slammed the only door we had which was the door to the bathroom. And then she was stuck in the bathroom <laughs> and she was even more mad because she's stuck in the bathroom and I'm out there in the rest of the apartment. Um, but, but the God who loves us starts with a question. The God who loves us asks the question, is it right for you to be angry? And I think that is a, a, a really good tool in all of our arsenals. If, if you wanted to, you know, make a note for yourself, put something on your mirror uh, and, and maybe a note to your younger selves. Uh, I think young men struggle with this more than some people who have uh, matured a bit. 
uh, in our younger days, we sometimes let our anger overtake us. And um, is it right for me to be angry today? Is, is what, I, what, I, what I have just gotten so bent out of shape about, is it really right for me to be angry? And that's one of the questions I'm going to have you reflect on uh, in, our, in our smaller groups. And so when, when Jonah gets mad, he goes out east of the city and he goes out to pout. I imagine him standing on the top of Stone Mountain. That's kind of, he goes out east of the city. He's up there on the top of, top of Stone Mountain. And on the top of Stone Mountain, he builds a booth. And this is what a booth might have looked like. This is what he would have done uh, to build a booth. And he just crosses his arms in his anger and his disappointment with God and waits. Because I think he's still holding out that God will destroy the city. You know, he doesn't want, he, he wants their repentance to be short-lived. He wants them to, to be destroyed. And so he goes up there and he pouts and in his anger, he takes his toys to go home and he's sitting out there and God won't leave him alone. And isn't that wonderful that we have a God that is relentless and the God, the God won't leave him alone. And so the Lord begins this game with Jonah uh, the Lord does not leave Jonah to himself with his scowling glare in the direction of Nineveh. Uh, and he just stops replying on words. Uh, in the beginning, he sends the fish to save Jonah. And God continues to use nature. And now God sends a bush. And that bush provides even more shade. We sometimes get caught up in such narrow concerns like a football game this weekend. Is there a football game this weekend? Uh, I once uh, had read the statistic that the Super Bowl is one of the, the, the worst times in America for spousal abuse. You ever heard that? It's not true. Uh, it's, uh, it's a myth that was perpetu perpetuated starting in 1993. It's not true. It's, it's not a time, the, the worst time for spousal abuse and for uh, women to leave the home is over the holidays. And so it's over the holidays. And I did some research because Matt and I were talking about it on the podcast. And I just kind of blurted out that isn't the Super Bowl. And I was like, I don't know that for a fact. Um, but it, I think that the reason people resonate with it is that people get so upset about a game. They get, you know, and, and their emotions can go from one direction to the other. I remember I was in California um, watching a certain Super Bowl, Jerry. And uh our beloved falcons were up by how many points does anybody remember 25 and they say that with such joy and such you know 25 points and 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 how 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 that took everybody's mood to a, such a different place even though uh there was much to be thankful for so while jonah waits the lord actively works and now we move to the second part of jonah so just as the Lord had appointed a fish and appointed a wind earlier, the Lord appoints or provides. I mean, this is the same word. The Lord provides. The Lord provides a bush and made it come up over Jonah. This is one of the funniest scenes in scripture. If you know what's really going on behind the scenes, as I read in the Tanakh, it doesn't say the Lord appointed a bush. The Lord appointed Racinus, R-I-C-I-N-I-S. Anybody know that plant? We'll get to that in a second. I mean, it's, it's such a funny scene. Then the Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. He's gone from complete and utter despair to joy because this bush has come up and grown over him. But when dawn came the next day, the God, God provided or appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God then prepared, sent, provided a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he, he was faint. And he asks again that he might die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. It, it's almost funny. And then uh, let me show you a picture of the plant. Anybody know that plant? You may have seen it. It's, it's a great shade plant, but in fact... It's a castor oil plant, Racinus communis, castor oil. Anybody old enough to have been given castor oil? Okay, only a couple of the ones in here. Maybe there are a few on, on, the, on the Zoom. 
but castor oil was was a laxative. Castor oil was a laxative. So God has created a plant that is a laxative to come over the retentive Jonah. <laughs> this is funny stuff. You know, castor oil is a natural emollient and a few drops can also be used to remedy dry skin, uh, massage oil and uh, benefit from the, the treatment. Uh, and so, uh, and God wanted Jonah to, to change because the fish vomited. You get some really great uh, physical comedy here. The fish vomited and wanted Jonah to, now wait for it, right? What did God want Jonah to do? Loosen up. Right? I mean, that, God sends a castor oil plant to cover Jonah and to give him shade. And it's kind of a wink, wink, nod, nod, just like, hey, that great city, Nineveh, that great city, Tuscaloosa. Um, not a great city on the plane, but that great city, Tuscaloosa. And he does it so he'll loosen up. And finally, Jonah is reproved in the ninth verse. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And Jonah says, yes, third time, right? Angry enough to die. It's like a high school girl that everything is drama. And this is as dramatic as Jonah can get. And then the Lord said, you're concerned about the bush for which you did not labor. You are concerned about the bush, an inanimate object. Uh, well, not really inanimate, it's a plant. But you're concerned about a plant more than you're concerned about the people of Nineveh. Give me a break, Jonah. You're concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and for which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished at night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. Now, who are people who don't know their right from their left? You have a new grandson there, Michael. Does he know his right from his left yet? No. The people who don't know their right from their left are the children. And so God says, can I not save a city despite their parents and their grandparents? Can't I save the city because of innocent children and animals? Don't you think that's a good thing? And he kind of holds up that reflection to Jonah and says, you know, I'm saving, I'm saving this, this, this whole corrupt community because I have hope for the future. I have hope for their children. You could be concerned about a bush and you're mad about the, the destruction of the bush and you need to be concerned about um, the, the children and the animals, the innocent. So we move to what God does in, in this whole thing. God appointed, God provided. In order to teach Jonah, in order to save the Ninevites, we have a Lord that provides. When you cry out to the Lord, God responds. God responds when people cry out. He sends a wind, he sends a fish to rescue, he sends a bush for shade, he sends a worm to teach Jonah a lesson, and then he sends a wind again to kind of push that lesson home. God responds when people cry out. Part of suffering is confusion. When, when, they're, when they're suffering, there's confusion. And people are confused and they, they don't know where to turn. I, I, love, uh, I love that you gave some of those Yogi Bearisms. These are a couple that I heard this week. They weren't Yogi Bearisms, but I thought they were good. Everything you fight has power over you. Everything you fight has power over you. Everything you accept does not. Think about that. Everything you fight has power over you. Everything you accept does not. And then I like this one as well. Everything worth doing will take longer than you think and will be harder than you thought. Everything worth doing will be, take longer than you, than you think and will be harder than you thought. And so we move to the next slide. I think we got one, a couple more. Um, God never blasts out in wrath against Jonah. God uses this as a teaching moment. 
but prophet gently and persuasively, he causes him a little discomfort to impress on Jonah what suffering might really mean. I remember talking to a group of men one day and I said, what is the worst pain in the world? And one of the men whose wife had seven children said, ice cream headache. His wife disagreed. But he said, ice cream headache. That's the worst pain in the world. So God is causing a, just a little bit of pain in the life of Jonah so that he might learn from that. And is showing Jonah that he is slow to anger, that God is slow to anger. Jonah wants God to be judge and jury and executioner. But God continues to be merciful. And that's why I think I love that it, 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 it has two meanings. It, it can mean greatly angry or deeply grieved. And as you deal with people in your life who are angry, uh, I, I invite you to ask the question, is it right for them to be angry? Is it right for them to be angry? In a discussion with Matt uh, this past week, I loved what he said. He said that one of the ways that you decide uh, whether you should be angry or not is to ask the question, would this make God angry? And if this would make God angry, you probably ought to be angry about it. But if this wouldn't make God angry, maybe you should cool your jets. Would this make God angry? And so I, I invite you. Uh, there's a thing from Appreciative Inquiry that says a complaint is merely a negatively phrased passion. You got that? A complaint is merely a negatively phrased passion. And so when someone is passionate about something, they often complain when things are not right. And their complaint is their negative way of trying to get at their passion. And so for me, my pastoral response when people are angry is to try and understand what's going on. Are, is there grief involved? Because it's the first stage of grief, right? When somebody is in grief, they, are, they get angry and then they can move into denial and bargaining and depression, uh, but finally acceptance. And sometimes the anger that people feel or that comes out at you is really some loss that they're feeling, some loss of comfort, some loss of the way they thought the world was going to be. Uh, Fran, you never had anybody angry at you as a politician. And, and, and how do you, how do you begin to understand them? Michael, as a realtor, you ever had anybody angry? Never, never. What's that? It's a calm business. I appreciate that. And, and how do you take a step back and lovingly try to understand what is going on? Because that anger is always a secondary emotion. There's something else going on. There's something go else going on with us as we experience anger. And we've got to be thinking about dealing with our own anger. And finally, I just want to remind people that Jonah is a sent ministry. And I've always used Jonah to understand what it meant to be a United Methodist pastor. I'd never heard of Stark, Georgia before they sent me there. And I went because it was what God had appointed. It was what God had sent. And um, it's a very humbling thing, I think, to go where God sends. Uh, you know, it'd be much easier to be like Nolan Arenado and play the free agent market and uh, to be able to choose where you want to go. But in our United Methodist system, we are much more like Jonah. And uh, we are told where we are going to go. And whether it be Nineveh or wonderful places like Dunwoody, it's some, it's, 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 a, it, it's not our decision. And uh, we go and do what God has called us to do where God has sent us. And I, I just have always thought of the United Methodist ministry as sort of a Jonah sent ministry. Somebody else said this. This is another one, Brian, maybe worth writing down. Anger is when the tongue works faster than the mind. You ever said something that was really fun to say? I have a preacher friend, I may have quoted this before, that uh, they needed to redo some of the area up front around the altar and at their church to make more room for the choir, Jim. They didn't have enough room for the choir. So they were making some alterations. And one of the older ladies in the church, who was like the church historian, you know the kind of person I'm talking about, she came up and started yelling at the pastor, you can't move this, it's always been this way. And he looked at her and he said, ma'am, when Jesus comes back, he ain't coming for the furniture. 
<laughs> Which is really fun to say, probably not the best thing to say. And uh, when we say things that might be fun to say, our tongue is uh, working faster than our mind and we often regret it. I'll remind you that uh, we continue to have our children's series. Our children are learning about the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, and goodness is in there somewhere. I don't know which translation they've gotten goodness from, but goodness is the word for the week. So if you want to take a word for the week or if you've got children or grandchildren in the church, uh, they're going to be looking at the word goodness this week. And I really think that's a great response to anger is goodness. Is it right for you to be angry? I hope you've enjoyed and learned some things from Jonah. So um, I invite you to uh, turn to your small groups. We'll do some breakouts and we'll ask the questions. When have you had a Jonah moment? moment, moment? What have you learned from Jonah? How do we know something is worth getting angry about? I think I've answered that, uh, kind of played my hand with that. But what, what is, if God's angry about it, it's probably worth you getting angry about it. If it wouldn't upset God, it might be something you need to let go. And then um, what are some of the best questions you've ever asked? Like God ask a great question. And when have you seen the Lord be merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love? Discuss among yourselves and we'll be back uh, before the end of the hour. All right, for those who are there live, I'll throw the questions back up on the screen here in a moment. Uh, four groups of four. Yep. Uh, for quarter note, get one beat. Uh, the ones who are online, you should have the questions in your chat. And I'm going to go ahead and break us up in groups and bring us back here in about 10 minutes. Where, when, have, when have you ever had a Jonah moment, and, and or what have you learned from Jonah? 